Chapter 8, Raymond B. Cattell and Hans J. Eysenck. The Evolution of Trait Theorists. In this chapter, we will explore the theories of Raymond B. Cattell and Hans J. Eysenck, both of whom were educated at the University of London. Both theories are based on sophisticated statistical techniques and both place great importance on the role of genetic factors and personality. However, it is often the case in science that researchers with similar orientations examine similar sets of data using similar techniques but arrive at very different conclusions. As we will see, there are common ideas in the theories of Cattell and Isink, yet the theories differ in several significant ways. Previous chapters introduced theories that attempted, in part, to improve on the Freudian tradition. These theories shared an interest in development from infancy through the later years. And with the exception of Alport's theory, they also traced many abnormal adult behaviors to problems or conflicts that occurred during childhood. In addition, these theories tended to focus on the idiosyncratic expression of each individual's personality, to de-emphasize average group processes, and to place only minor emphasis, if any, on scientific methods. The theories of Cattell and Isink represent distinct departures from the theories discussed in preceding chapters. Both emphasize the scientific discovery and measurement of basic psychological traits possessed by all people. Both use scientific rather than clinical methodology, and although both devote considerable time attempting to understand psychopathology, they are primarily concerned with explaining the personality of normal adults. And, as noted above, both are more interested in the contributions of biological and genetic factors than in developmental events. Biographical Sketches Raymond B. Cattell Raymond B. Cattell was born in Staffordshire, England, on March 20, 1905. England entered World War I when Cattell was nine years old, and the war had a major effect on his life. Seeing hundreds of wounded soldiers treated in a nearby house that had been converted into a hospital taught him life could be short and one should accomplish as much as possible while one could. As we will see, the sense of urgency about work characterized Cattell throughout his academic life. At 16, Cattell entered the University of London where he majored in physics and chemistry. He graduated in 1924 at 19 with high honors. Throughout his undergraduate years, Cattell became increasingly concerned with social problems and was aware that his background in the natural sciences had not prepared him to deal with those problems. These realizations prompted him to enter graduate school in psychology at the University of London, where he earned his PhD degree in 1929. In 1937, the University of London granted Cattell an honorary doctorate in science in recognition of his many accomplishments. While in graduate school, he worked with the famous psychologist statistician Charles E. Spearman, who invented the technique of factor analysis and applied it to the study of intelligence. As we shall see, Cattell used factor analysis extensively in his study of personality. After receiving his PhD, Cattell had great difficulty finding work doing what he had been trained to do, so he accepted a number of what he called fringe jobs. He was a lecturer at the University of Exeter in England, and he was the founder and director of a psychology clinic in the school system in the city of Leicester, England. In 1937, he was invited by the prominent American psychologist Edward L. Thorndike to come to America to become, to become his research associate at Columbia University. Cattell accepted Thorndike's invitation and remembered his first year in New York City as depressing because he missed England greatly. From 1938 to 1941, Cattell was the G. Stanley Hall Professor of Genetic Psychology at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. In 1941, Gordon Allport invited Cattell to join the faculty at Harvard University, where in the stimulating environment provided by Allport, Henry Murray, and Robert White, Cattell expanded the application of factor analysis from the study of intelligence to the more diverse problems of personality theory. He remained at Harvard as a lecturer until 1944. In 1945, at the age of 40, Cattell was offered a position at the University of Illinois as research professor and director of the Laboratory of Personality and Group Analysis. Without teaching responsibilities, Cattell was finally able to pursue his ambition of determining the structure of personality scientifically. Cattell's profound output while he was at the University of Illinois was voluminous. Cattell pursued his goal until at least 11 p.m. every night and observed that his car was easy for him to find the parking lot because it was the only one left. Throughout his 70-year career, Cattell published more than 450 professional articles and more than 40 books. In 1953, Cattell wrote an essay on the psychology of the researcher, which won the Winner Grin Prize given by the New York Academy of Sciences, and he held the Darwin Fellowship for Genetic Research. 
The scope of Cattell's research interest is evident when one considers he published articles in American, British, Australian, Japanese, Indian, and African journals. In 1997, the American Psycholo Psychological Foundation awarded Cattell the prestigious Gold Medal Award for Life Achievement in Psychological Science. However, presentation of the award was postponed while a panel considered the controversial positions Cattell had taken on a number of social and political issues. Cattell requested that his name be withdrawn from consideration, and it was. Cattell died on February 2, 1998, at his home in Honolulu at the age of 92. Hans Jürgen Eisnick was born in Berlin on March 4, 1916. His father, Edward, was a celebrated actor and singer, and his mother, Ruth Werner Eisnick, acted in silent films using her stage name, Helga Molander. His parents divorced when he was two years old, and his father initially wanted Eisnick to carry on the family tradition in the theater. His acting career was short-lived, however. Eisnick recalled that at the tender age of five or six, he played a minor role in a film in which his mother starred, but he was not allowed to see his own performance in the adults-only feature. In the film, he helped to reconcile his estranged parents, but that role was not played out in his real life. His father remarried and remained in Berlin, and his mother moved to Paris to avoid Nazi persecution after marrying Max Glass, a Jewish filmmaker. Eisenk's father was Catholic and his mother was Protestant, Lutheran. However, both were more deeply moved by the theater and theater life than by religion. Although young Eisenk believed that socialism could solve many of Germany's problems, he did not embrace Hitler's Nazi party, nor was he interested in joining the Communist Party or various underground political movements. After being told that he could not attend college in Germany unless he joined the Nazi secret police, he left Germany permanently in the summer of 1934 to live in France with his mother and her husband. He studied literature and history for approximately one year at the University of Dijon and then moved to England where he took college prerequisite courses at Pittman College and then enrolled at the University of London. Isaac's early life experiences and his year in France convinced him that he did not want to pursue a career in the arts and he went to London with the intention of studying physics. In his 1980 autobiographical essay, he recalled, I had from the beginning of my conscious life been quite decided that art was for fun, for emotional experiences, for enjoyment, and that my life's work would lie in science. By that I meant physics and astronomy. I was told I could not study physics because I'd taken the wrong subjects in my matrix. I could not wait another year and retake the right subject, so I asked if there was any scientific subject I could take. Yes, I was told. There was always psychology. What on earth is that? I inquired in my ignorance. You'll like it, they said. And so I enrolled in a subject whose scientific status was perhaps a little more questionable than my advisors realized. During 1949 and 1950, Isaacs traveled to the United States where he held a visiting professorship at the University of Pennsylvania. During that visit, Isaacs studied training programs in clinical psychology and the roles of clinical psychologists in general. Upon his return to England, he campaigned for a more scientific psychological training for clinical psychologists for more applications of scientific psychological principles in therapy and for independence from psychiatrists. He became particularly dissatisfied with adherence to Freudian theory, both in psychiatry and clinical psychology, and began to develop a new approach in clinical training at Maudsley Hospital, a premier British psychiatric facility, an approach that focused on behavioral therapy. In 1952, he assessed the effectiveness of Freudian psychotherapy and published evidence that patients experienced psychoanalytic therapy improved no more than patients who had received no therapy at all. He remained a severe critic of Freudian analysis as well as projective testing methods throughout his life. Beginning with the review of L. L. Thurston's work in Factor Analysis, published while he was still an undergraduate, Eisnick wrote 61 books and edited 10 others, and published more than 1,000 research articles, reviews, and book chapters. In a career that spanned more than 55 productive years, he also founded the Graduate Department of Psychology in the Institute of Psychiatric at Maudsley Hospital, and was its head for 30 years until his retirement in 1983 at age 65. Founded and edited two psychological journals, Behavior Research and Therapy and Personality and Individual Differences, and gave numerous addresses at psychological conferences and lectured at numerous universities throughout the world. Isaac continued to conduct research on personality and other topics until his death from cancer on September 4, 1997. 
In 1988, Isaac received the APA's Award for Distinguished Contribution to Science, and in 1994 received the APA's Presidential Citation for Outstanding Contribution to Psychology. In 1996, the APA Division of Clinical Psychology, as part of the celebration of the 100th year of clinical psychology, presented Isaac with a special Centennial Award. A 2002 analysis of the most 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 influential psychologists of the 20th century listed Isaac as 13th. However, he was the third most cited psychologist, according to the same report. Factor analysis. Even the naive psychology student has heard something about Freud, Jung, or Skinner before reading this text. Few new students, if asked to name influential psychologists, would come up with the names of Cattell or Isink. It also seems fair to say that Cattell's and Isink's theories of personality have not become overwhelmingly popular among those studying personality. The lack of wide acceptance can be explained by two facts. First, the sheer bulk of these theorists' contributions makes it impossible from the, for the outsider to digest. And as we noted in the biographical sketch above, Isaac's work was at least as extensive as Cattell's. It would be difficult for any scholar not devoted exclusively to mastering the works of Cattell or Isaac to understand the breadth of their theoretical work and critique it effectively. All that one could reasonably do with either theory would be to sample parts of them and hope that the most important concepts are included in that sample. Such samples are offered in this chapter. Second, both theories rely on factor analysis. There is no doubt that the apparent complexities of this technique have caused many to overlook Cattell and Eisenach's theories. We contend, however, that factor analysis is only apparently complex, and the logic behind it is simple and straightforward. Because in most important ways, to understand factor analysis is to understand Cattell's, and to a lesser extent, Eisenach's theory of personality, we begin with a rudimentary discussion of factor analysis. The cornerstone of factor analysis is the concept of correlation. When two variables vary together, they are correlated, that is, co-related. For example, the correlation exists between height and weight because when one increases, the other will also tend to increase. The stronger the tendency is for two variables to vary together, the stronger is the correlation between them. The strength of the relationship between two variables is expressed mathematically by a correlation coefficient. A correlation coefficient can vary in magnitude from plus one to minus one. A coefficient of plus one indicates a perfect positive correlation between two variables. That is, as measures on one variable increase, so will measures on the second variable. A coefficient of minus one indicates a perfect negative correlation between two variables. That is, as measures on one variable increase, measures on the other variable decrease. A correlation coefficient of plus 0 .80, 0 0.80 indicates a strong positive correlation between two variables, but not a perfect one. A coefficient of negative 0.56, negative 0.56, indicates a moderate negative correlation, and so on. In general, factor analysis begins with a large number of measurements taken from a large sample of people, although one could be also begin by taking those same measurements many times from one individual. The data may include many different types of dependent variables. For example, it might record biographical information, birth order, number of siblings, ages of parents, etc. Results of different tests and questionnaires, like IQ scores, scores on various personality inventories. Results of different experiments, scores from a learning experiment, reaction times in a decision-making task, etc. And perhaps even physiological data such as heart rates and electroencephalogram recordings. The next step is to intercorrelate all of the data, creating a correlation matrix. To simplify matters, let's say the data we are analyzing consists of performance on five tests. A hypothetical outcome of such an analysis is shown in Table 8-1. Next, the following assumptions are made. 1. Two tests that measure the same variable must give similar results. In other words, tests measuring the same ability tend to be correlated. And 2. The agreement correlation between the two tests will indicate the extent to which the two tests measure the same thing. In the hypothetical correlation matrix depicted in Table 8-1, it is clear that tests A, B, and C have a great deal in common with one another because they are perfectly positively correlated, but they have nothing in common with tests D and E. Conversely, tests D and E have a great deal in common because they are perfectly correlated with each other, but they have nothing in common with tests A, B, and C. 
Under these circumstances, our correlation matrix reveals two separate factors or traits. One is measured by tests A, B, and C, and the other is measured by tests D and E. The search for tests that are highly correlated with each other is called a cluster analysis. When a cluster of tests showing high correlation with one another is observed, the tests are considered to measure the same ability or characteristic. An ability discovered in such a way is called a factor. And in both Cattell's and Isaac's theories, the term factor can be equated with the term trait. Therefore, in Table 8-1, tests A, B, and C identify one trait, while tests D and E measure another one. The procedures of factor analysis can be summarized as follows. 1. Measure many people in a variety of ways. 2. Correlate performance on each measure with performance on every other measure. This creates a correlation matrix. 3. Determine how many factors, traits, need to be postulated in order to account for the various intercorrelations, clusters, found in the correlation matrix. A sample of the ways in which three tests could be related to each other is shown in figure 8-1. The upper left corner of the figure shows what would happen if the three tests measure separate factors. The upper right corner shows that tests A and B tend to measure a common factor, but test C measures a different factor. The lower left corner of the figure indicates that all three tests measure a common factor. And the lower right corner of the figure shows that test A measures one factor, but test B and C measures another factor. Factor analysis, then, is a technique based on the methods of correlation that attempts to account for interrelationships found among numerous measures. The technique is certainly not confined to the study of personality. As mentioned earlier, Cattell's mentor, Charles Spearman, used factor analysis to study intelligence, and Cattell, in addition to using it to study personality, used factor analysis to study the characteristics of groups, institutions, and even nations. Cattell's approach to research. Cattell's early work is an example of inductive reasoning, or inductive research. That is, he began without a specific guiding hypothesis, collected a large data set, and generated future hypotheses from patterns that emerge from the data. Cattell's procedure was to measure many persons in as many ways as possible. For example, he recorded the everyday behavior of various persons, such as how many accidents they had, the number of organizations to which they belonged, and the number of social contacts they had. He called the information gathered by such observations L-data, the L for life record. He gave his subjects questionnaires on which they rated themselves on various characteristics. He called the information gathered by such, te such te a technique Q-data, for Q for questionnaire. Q-data includes performance on standard <clears throat> self-reported inventories and various scales that measure attitudes, opinions, and interests. Cattell realized that Q-data has limitations. First. Some persons may not know much about themselves, and therefore their responses to questionnaires, inventories, and scales may not reflect their true personalities. Second, some subjects falsify or distort their responses to create a desirable image of themselves. To overcome the problems inherent in Q-data, Cattell used a third source of data that he called T-data, the T for test. T-data is gathered in situations in which examinees cannot know what aspect of their behavior is being evaluated. Examples include performance on word association tests, the Wortschatz ink blot test, or the thematic apperception test. Cattell referred to such tests as objective because he believed they are resistant to faking. Cattell and Warburton listed more than 400 tests that appear to meet this criterion. Cattell used factor analysis to search for clusters of measurements that occur in stable patterns across a number of situations over long periods of time. He then attempted to determine the extent to which these factors are, in fact, fundamental personality traits. As we will see in Figure 8-2, Cattell claimed to have identified 16 fundamental traits found in normal personality. Isink's approach to research. <clears throat> Isaac's approach was an example of hypothetico-deductive reasoning, contrasted with Cattell's inductive reasoning. That is, he began with an experimental hypothesis derived from an existing theory, logically deduced testable predictions from the hypothesis, and then gathered data to determine whether the predictions were accurate. When they were, the hypothesis was supported and subjected to additional tests. When the predictions were inaccurate, the hypothesis was refuted and either abandoned or modified. 
It's important to note that Isink and other used other used factor analysis for the most part at the beginning of his research process. That is, he used the procedure to identify and verify the fundamental components of personality. A factor analysis and his role as a factor analysis, he said, I'm the one who thinks least of it. I regard it as a useful adjunct, a technique that was invaluable under certain circumstances, but one which we must leave behind as soon as possible in order to get a proper causal type of understanding of the factors and to know what they mean. Taxonomy of Traits <clears throat> Cattell's Analysis of Traits Cattell considered traits the building blocks of personality, and clearly the concept of trait is the most important concept in his theory. Most of his factor analytic research was a search for personality traits, and that search uncovered several categories of traits which we review next. Surface Traits and Source Traits The difference between surface traits and source traits was probably the most important distinction made in Cattell's theory. Surface traits are groups of observations that are correlated. For example, people with more formal education may read more fiction than people with less formal education do. Such observations are superficial in that they explain nothing. They are simply a statement about types of observed characteristics that are correlated. Such characteristics can, and probably do, have many causes. Source traits, conversely, are the causes of behaviors. They constitute the most important part of a person's personality structure and are ultimately responsible for all of a person's consistent behavior. Thus, every surface trait is caused by one or more source traits, and a single source trait can influence several surface traits. Cattell concluded that all individuals possess the same source traits, but do so in varying degrees. For example, all people possess intelligence, a source trait, but all people do not possess the same amount of intelligence. The strength of this source trait is a given individual, in a given individual will influence many things about that person. For example, what the person reads, who his or her friends are, and what he or she does for a living. All of these outward manifestations of the source trait of intelligence are surface traits. Our examples are somewhat misleading, however, because hardly anything that a person does is caused by only one source trait. Cattell's early factor analysis of L and Q data yielded 16 source traits that characterized the normal personality. The first 12 factors listed were discovered by factor analyzing L data or by factor analyzing combined L and Q data. The last four emerged only from the factor analysis of Q data. Cattell, with Saunders and Stice, constructed his influential 16 personality factor questionnaire around these 16 factors. The 16 personality factors, PF, was used for assessing the personality traits of various age groups and in agreement with Freud, the results indicate that the major source traits characterizing adult personality appear at about the age of four. Here's table 8-2. Factors that Cattell concluded were the building blocks of personality. Factors A, B, C, E, and F. I'd recommend reading through those to make sure you get a feel of what they are. Here is factors G, H, I, L, and M. And continued factors N, O, Q1, and Q2. And Q3 and Q4. Constitutional and environmental mold traits. Some source traits are genetically determined and are called constitutional source traits. Others result from experience and are called environmental mold traits. If source traits found by found by if source traits found by factorizing are pure, independent influences, as present evidence suggests, a source trait could not be due both to heredity and environment, but must spring from one or the other. Patterns of springing from internal conditions or influences we may call constitutional source traits. On the other hand, a pattern might be imprinted on the personality by something external to it. Such source traits appearing as factors we may call environmental mold traits because they spring from the molding effect of social institutions and physical realities which constitute the cultural pattern. Ability traits. Some source traits determine how effectively a person works toward a desired goal. Such traits are ability traits. One of the most important ability traits is intelligence. 
Cattell distinguished between two types of intelligence, crystallized and fluid. He defined fluid intelligence as an innate form of intelligence that is adaptable to different situations, similar to that of problem solving and independent of any previous experience. Cattell defined crystallized intelligence as the type of intelligence acquired through schooling, or what we know as knowledge. Cattell, Cattell believed that too often, a person's intelligence is, is equated with crystallized intelligence, which most traditional IQ tests attempt to measure. To help remedy the situation, Cattell developed the culture-free intelligence test designed to measure fluid intelligence. Cattell's research led him to conclude that both fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence are strongly influenced by heredity, and he concluded that fluid intelligence is 65% inherited and crystallized intelligence is 60% inherited. According to Cattell, then, both one's general intelligence, fluid intelligence, and one's ability to benefit from experience, crystallized intelligence, are largely inherited. There's an ongoing debate in psychology concerning the relative contributions of genetics and experience to one's level of intelligence, a variation of the nature-nurture problem. Cattell's belief that intelligence is largely innate, that is, genetically determined, and the implications of that belief are among the issues that make Cattell a controversial figure. Temperament Traits Temperament traits are genetically determined characteristics that determine the speed, energy, and emotion with which a person responds to a situation. They determine how mild-mannered, irritable, or persistent a person is. Temperament traits, therefore, are constitutional source traits that determine a person's emotionality. Of the source traits measured by the 16 PEF, 15 are temperament traits, and 1, intelligence, is an ability trait. Dynamic traits. Temperament traits determine a person's style of behaving. They determine how a person typically responds to situations. Ability traits determine a person's effectiveness in solving problems. They determine how well a person typically responds to situations. Dynamic traits determine why a person responds to situations. Dynamic traits set the person in motion towards some goal. They are the motivational elements of personality. Cattell elaborated two different dynamic or motivational traits, ergs and meta-ergs. An erg is a dynamic constitutional source trait. An erg is similar to what other theorists have called drives, needs, or instincts. Cattell chose the term erg from the Greek ergon, meaning energy, because he thought the other motivational terms were too ambiguous. The ergs provide the energy for all behavior and can vary in intensity. One can be hungry, sexually aroused, curious, or angry in varying degrees. The level at which an erg exists determines the amount of erg, erg, ergic tension present. It's interesting to note that in claiming all human behavior is ultimately instinctual, Cattell essentially agreed with Freud. Cattell's list of instincts, ergs, however, was far more extensive than Freud's. Cattell's research has revealed 11 ergs which are listed on the right side of figure 8-4. A meta-erg is a dynamic source trait with an environmental origin. In other words, a meta-erg is an environmental mold dynamic source trait. Thus, a meta-erg is the same as an erg except for its origin. Both ergs and meta-ergs cause motivational predispositions towards certain environmental objects. However, ergs are innate whereas meta-ergs are learned. Meta-ergs are divided into sentiments and attitudes. According to Cattell, sentiments are major acquired dynamic trait structures which cause their processors to pay attention to certain objects or classes of objects and to feel and react in a certain way with regard to them. Cattell believes sentiments are usually centered on such things as one's career or profession, sports, religion, one's parents, one's spouse or sweetheart, or oneself. The most powerful sentiment of all, according to Cattell, is the self-sentiment, which organizes the entire personality. A sentiment is an acquired predisposition to respond to a class of objects or events in a certain way. An attitude is more specific, but is derived from a sentiment, which in turn is derived from an erg. An attitude, according to Cattell, is a tendency to respond in a particular way in a particular situation to a particular object or event. Cattell described the manifestation of an attitude, thus, oh, uh, with an attitude like this. In these circumstances, it was a stimulus situation, I, that's the organism, want so much, the interest need of a certain intensity, to do this, the specific goal course of action, with that. 
that is the object concerned in action. Thus, an attitude is an interest of a certain intensity in doing something with something in a certain situation. Cattell used the term subsidiation to describe the fact that sentiments are subsidiary to ergs, i.e. dependent on them, and attitudes are subsidiary to sentiments. Stated differently, attitudes are studied, factor analyzed, to discover more basic sentiments, and sentiments are studied, factor analyzed, to discover more basic ergs. The relationships among attitudes, sentiments, and ergs can be diagrammed in what Cattell called the dynamic lattice. Cattell maintains that ergic desires are seldom satisfied directly. Instead, one usually goes about satisfying a basic need indirectly. For example, one may develop skills to get a job, get married, or satisfy one's sex drive. Cattell called this indirect satisfaction of an ergic impulse long-circuiting. In addition, Cattell stated that each sentiment is a function of or subsidiary to a large number of ergs. For example, a sentiment toward one's spouse reflects the ergs of sex, gregariousness, protection, and self-assertion. The most important point about the dynamic lattice is that it demonstrates the complexity of human motivation. Attitudes, sentiments, and ergs are constantly interacting and are constantly reflecting not only current circumstances, but also an individual's future goals. Isaac's Analysis of Traits Isaac included the concept of intelligence in a general, informal discussion of personality, and he clearly acknowledged the genetic aspects of intelligence. The focus of his formal theory of personality, however, is temp temperament, defined as the emotional, motivational, and non-ability-related cognitive aspects of behavior. Isaac did not include intelligence, cognitive ability, or other so-called ability traits in this definition, and he often used the terms personality and temperament interchangeably. For Isink, the most important traits were like those that Cattell would categorize as constitutional source traits, but they were broader in scope than Cattell's building blocks. Isink referred to them as types or superfactors. In Isink's theory, the important superfactors and the lesser traits that they influence are relatively permanent, have clear biological origins, and influence secondary behavioral patterns acquired through learning. Although he believed that the environment makes important contributions to overall patterns of behavior and personality, Isaac's theory does not have a trait concept akin to Cattell's environmental mold trait. For Isaac, types and traits they encompass were genetically determined. They do not arise from learning. Historical Roots of Isaac's Theory Jung's Hypothesis As we saw in Chapter 3, Jung viewed the introvert as an individual who was reflective, basically withdrawn, and oriented toward subjective or internal reality, while the extrovert is outgoing and oriented toward external events. Jung also speculated that when introverts experience neurotic disorders, they exhibit internalized symptoms such as anxiety, sensitivity, fatigue, and exhaustion. Isaac proposed the term dysthymic to refer to the severely disordered neurotic introvert. On the other hand, Jung proposed that extrovert expresses neurotic disorders with physical symptoms, tics or historical paralysis, that are externalized and removed from the inner self. Isaac used the term hysteric to refer to this disordered neurotic extrovert. In his first book, The Dimensions of Personality, Isaac reported that two major independent types of superfactors described psychiatric patients and personalities in general. These were neuro, neuroticism, neuroticism versus stability, N, and extroversion versus introversion, E. These superfactors appear to separate highly neurotic soldiers into two groups. Indeed, the most severe cases seem to be individuals who express either the introverted pattern of anxiety-related symptoms, dysthymia, or the extroverted pattern of hysteric disorders, hysteria, thus confirming the hypothesis suggested by Jung. In the hierarchical structures shown in figure 8-4, each higher order type of superfactor includes a number of correlated traits. Thus, an individual who is highly neurotic expresses this general factor through the traits of anxiety, depression, feelings of guilt, low self-esteem, and so on. Similarly, the figure shows the individuals who is highly extroverted tends to be sociable, lively, assertive, and sensation-seeking, to name only a few. <coughs> After identifying the first two general types, Esnick constructed the Maudsley Medical Questionnaire, which could be administered to hospitalized neurotic soldiers as well as to healthy individuals who are neither hospitalized nor complaining of psychological problems. Questionnaires developed later included the Eisnick Personality Inventory, the Eisnick Personality Questionnaire, 
and the revised Isaac Personality Questionnaire. In his second book, The Scientific Study of Personality, Isaac paid considerable attention to differences between hospitalized patients and healthy people. He concluded that a third superfactor, psychoticism, must be added to N and E to provide a complete description of personality. It should be noted the final type P was included primarily to aid in making distinctions between those soldiers with neurotic disorders and those who would be diagnosed with psychotic disorders. Although psychoticism remained part of Eisenach's theoretical scheme, it did not play a major role in his research concerning the personality structures of normal, healthy people. In figure 8-4, we see that the correlated traits under the superfactor of psychoticism include being aggressive, cold, egocentric, impulsive, and so forth. Despite the order in which these the three superfactors were identified, Isaac and others often use the acronym PEN, psychoticism, extroversion, neuroticism, to refer to the superfactor theory. Additional historical influences. Although their approaches were not scientific by contemporary standards, Isaac gave credit to Hippocrates and the Greek physician Galen for their influence on his thinking about personality. Hippocrates believed that humans consisted of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Furthermore, he associated each element with a humor, earth with black bile, air with yellow bile, fire with blood, water with phlegm. It was Galen who extended Hippocrates' thinking to temperaments, thus creating an early theory of personality. If the dominant or excessive body humor is blood, the individual expresses a sanguine personality and is warm, optimistic, and easygoing. If black bile dominates, it produces a melancholic personality and the individual is depressed and anxious. An excess of yellow bile produces a choler choleric, choleric personality, which is expressed as by excitability, anger, and assertiveness. Finally, if there is excessive phlegm, the individual is phlegmatic and therefore slow, lazy, or lethargic, and calm. In Galen's analysis, we see the first theory of psychological types. These embryonic ideas about personality were developed further by the influential philosopher Immanuel Kant. When he included a detailed discussion of temperament in his book, Anthropology from a Pragmatic Point of View. Like the analysis of Hippocrates and Galen, Kant's analysis of temperament did not allow for combinations of types. For example, one could not be phlegmatic, melancholic, a person who is anxious and worried, as well as reasonable and principled. It was Wilhelm Wundt, founder of the first experimental psychology laboratory, who developed the idea that personality was not a simple, use, simple issue of categorical type. Wundt pointed out that the categories were described by Kant were matters of degree, depending on one's position along the dimensions of emotional strength and emotional changeability. Choleric and melancholic types, for example, tend to experience intense emotions, while sanguine and phlegmatic types tend to have less intense emotional experiences. In addition, choleric and sanguine types supposedly experience very rapid changes in their emotions, while melancholic and phlegmatic types are described as more stable, experiencing slower emotional changes. Isaac and Isaac further developed his analysis by recognizing that extroversion, introversion, was equated by to the dimension that once called emotional changeability, and that neuroticism, stability versus instability, was identical to the dimension that one labeled emotional strength. Biological base of personality. For Isaac, it was not enough to establish a measure system of taxonomy or personality types. His quest to interrelate test scores, behavior, and underlying biological mechanisms with empirical data make his contribution to personality theory both unique and historically important. Excitation and inhibition. In his first attempt to develop a biological explanation of personality, Isaac adopted ideas from the Russian researcher who discovered classical conditioning, Ivan Pavlov, and, American, and an American neo-behaviorist, Clark Hull. Isaac borrowed from Pavlov's work and suggested that individuals who are slow to arouse and have low excitatory potentials are more likely to be extroverted while individuals who are more easily aroused and overwhelmed by stimuli are more likely to display more introverted behavior. Hull used the concept of reactive inhibition to explain phenomena like experimental extinction, in which we observe decreased performance of a response. Basically, reactive inhibition is caused by fatigue, either muscle or neuro, and acts to inhibit responding. Regarding the role of inhibition in personality, Isink wrote in his typological postulate. Similarly, 
individuals in whom reactive inhibition is developed quickly, in whom strong reactive inhibitions are gener generated, and in whom re reactive inhibition is dissipated slowly, are thereby predisposed to develop extroverted patterns of behavior. Conversely, individuals in whom reactive inhibition is developed slowly, in whom weak reactive inhibitions are generated, and in whom reactive inhibition is dissipated quickly, are thereby predisposed to develop introverted patterns of behavior. Cortical and emotional arousal. According to Jensen, Isaac consistently rejected any theory, including his own, that was contradicted by empirical evidence. So when Eisenach's efforts to explain personality in terms of excitation and inhibition proved disappointing, he turned to arousal therapy theory, which is based on well-documented brain processes. His use of arousal theory preserves the essential idea that higher levels of neural activity characterize the introvert's brain, and it improves on the earlier theory that by providing an explanation, by providing an explanation for the neuroticism's stability in dimensions of personality. The newer approach relies on two widely studied arousal systems in the brain. The first system, discovered by Maruzi and Megun, is called the Ascending Reticular Activating System, ARAS, and is responsible for patterns of excitation and inhibition of the cerebral cortex. The second system, referred to by Eisnick as the visceral brain, VB, is more often called the limbic system. It regulates emotional expression and controls autonomic responses, the symptoms of emotion, such as heartbeat, blood pressure, and sweating. Isaac suggested that extroversion and introversion is controlled by the ARAS, while emotional expression, including neuroticism, is independently medi me mediated by the VB. As in the earlier theory summarized in the typological postulate, the introvert is characterized by higher levels of cortical excitation or arousal, mediated by the ARAS, than the extrovert. The neurotic is characterized by higher levels of autonomic activity or reactivity mediated by the VB than the stable individual. Thus, the neurotic introvert, including Isaac's dysthymic, has the highest overall arousal. Both the ARAS and the VB are, high, are highly active. The individual that Isaac called the normal extrovert experiences the lowest baseline arousal. Both the ARAS and the VB are relatively inactive. The normal introvert and the neurotic extrovert are expected to fall between these extreme cases. Most recently, Eisnick explored the relationships between psychoticism and the activities of hormones such as testosterone and arousal-related enzymes such as moamine oxidase. At this time, links between hormones, enzymes, and psychoticism continue to be explored. Is anatomy destiny? When posed for theorists like Freud and Orni, Orni, this question addresses the issue of gender. For Cattell and Isaac, the question of anatomy and destiny takes on special meaning. Both theories provide strong evidence for the heritability of key traits or types. Heritability is defined as the proportion of the total variance in the phototype which is due to genotype. In other words, those differences in expression or appearance of a trait that are attributed to genetic influences rather than to environmental events. Thus, to the extent that genetic and biological factors are critical determinants of personality, the answer to the question, although not necessarily concerned with, concern with gender, must be yes. Cattell, heredity versus environment. No other personality theorist did more than Cattell to determine the relative condition, contributions of heredity and environment to the development of each personality trait. To examine these contributions, Cantel created a complicated statistical procedure called Multiple Abstract Various Analysis, MAVA. Measurements are taken of identical twins raised together, identical twins raised apart, fraternal twins raised together, fraternal twins raised apart, siblings raised together, and siblings raised apart, unrelated persons raised together, and unrelated persons raised apart. The number of genes in common is highest for identical twins, then fraternal twins and siblings, and is lowest for unrelated persons. The logic of such research is straightforward. If a trait is genetically determined, the degree to which two persons possess it should be correlated with the degree to which they share the same genes. For example, if a trait is completely genetically determined, then identical twins should possess that trait whether they are raised together or apart. On the basis of the type of research just described, Cattell concluded that heredity plays a significant role in the development of at least some traits. He confirmed his earlier observations that fluid intelligence is about 65% genetically determined. 
Also, the tendency to have a zestful, active disposition versus the reflective, circumspective one was found to be about 70% genetically determined. Cattell, Sugar, and Klein studied the heritability of three source traits, or ego strength, factor C, super ego strength, factor G, and cell sentiment, factor Q3. In this particular study, a 10-hour battery of tests was administered to 94 identical twins reared together, 124 fraternal twins reared together, 470 brothers reared together, 2,973 unrelated children reared apart. Using the MAVA procedure, the authors found that super ego strength, factor G, is largely a function of environmental influences rather than heredity. However, ego strength, factor C, and self sentiment, factor Q3, were strongly influenced by heredity. Cattell reported the heritability of most of the other source traits. Several traits are found to have a genetic component of about 30% or more. When the overall contribution of heredity to personality is considered, Cattell essentially confirmed his earlier conclusion that personality is about two-thirds determined by environmental influences and about one-third by heredity. Eisnick, the biological argument. Eisnick and Eisnick, Eisnick and Eisnick stated that in order to demonstrate that P, E, and N have biological basis, one, data must demonstrate heritability or genetic contribution to P, E, and N, two, Observations must confirm traits similar to P, E, and N in non-human animals. And three, evidence of P, E, and N must be found in many different cultures. And four, P, E, and N must be found to be stable over time. Vukasovic and Bratko conducted a meta-analytic review of the literature on the relationship between genetics and personality traits. They reviewed family, twin, and adoption studies to determine the levels of heritability of different traits. Their research suggested that approximately 40% of individual differences in personality are due to genetics, while 60% are due to the environment. While they examined several different models, they found that the level of heritability for eigensix factors was 39% for extroversion, 42% for neuroticism, and 30% for psychoticism. This research satisfies Eisenck's first condition. Research in the area of non-human temperament has generally been conducted by recording the activities of different individual animals in social groups. Researchers can avoid anthropomorphizing, but still record whether an animal affiliates with others, is aggressive, actively avoids others, and so on. Using this method, with rhesus monkeys, Chamov, Eisnick, and Harlow factor and analyzed their data and found three independent behavior clusters that correspond roughly to P, E, and N. Chimpanzees also exhibit behaviors that are best described by three independent dimensions, like those proposed by Eysenck. Recent research using the five-factor model has found similarities in extroversion and neuroticism among orangutans and chimpanzees, providing further evidence that these personality traits are found in non-human species. This research addresses Eysenck's second requirement. Confirming Eysenck's third provision through conducting across cultural personality assessments has some challenges. However, many attempts to gather trait and type data across cultures have confirmed widespread existence of P, E, and N. Again, summarizing large database, Isaac and Isaac wrote, Not wishing to paint the lily, we will refrain from commenting at too great length on the results, except to say that they are strongly in support of the view that essentially the same dimensions of personality emerge from factor analytic studies of identical questionnaires in a large number of different countries, embracing not only European cultural groups, but also many quite different types of nations. And finally, many studies have demonstrated that Isink's superfactors, particularly E and N, are quite stable. They've been shown to be consistent over 12-year periods, 15 to 20-year periods, and even more for 30 years. Some newer research suggests, however, that while personality may be stable at the population level, there is significant individual variability among extroversion and neuroticism. Conflicting research makes Isink's final condition more challenging to satisfy. Newer medical technology has allowed for a different way to validate Eisenick's idea that there is a biological base for personality traits. Puke Perez and colleagues examined, the other, examined whether older adults with certain PEN traits released, released more cortisol in the morning. They found that women high in neuroticism did release more cortisol in the morning, but there was no significant impact on this trait in males. There was also no difference in the amount of cortisol released during, depending on the high level on the level of extroversion. But this contradiction previous results contradicted previous results, which used the big five. Hill, Billington, and Krylo, for example, did find a relationship between an between 
AM cortisol release and extroversion as measured by the Big Five inventory. Based on both current and prior research, the criteria that ISYNC identified as necessary in order to claim that a trait has a biological basis are satisfied. Most researchers working with the trait approach currently adopt, accept this conclusion to some degree, although the exact nature of the biological mechanisms underlying personality traits remains to be determined. Psychopathology. Cattell suggested two reasons for psychopathology. One is the abnormal imbalance of the normal personality traits measured by the 16PF. For instance, an excessive amount of factor A, affectia versus cysia, could result in a manic depressive disorder. The second reason for psychopathology is the possession of abnormal traits that are not found among normal individuals. Cattell and his colleagues isolated 12 abnormal traits that can be described to describe various types of neurosis and psychosis. Cattell devised the clinical analysis questionnaire to assess these abnormal traits. The 12 abnormal traits Cattell discovered are listed in Table 8-3. In Table 8-3, the first seven abnormal traits, symbolized by the letter D, are depressive traits. The last five traits are considered relatively more powerful and more serious. Cattell then saw some individuals with serious psychopathology as quantitatively different from normal individuals, while others were seen as qualitatively different. That is, they possess qualities, abnormal traits, not found in people who are not suffering from psychological disorders. Isink, on the other hand, saw the differences between normal individuals and those with psychopathologies only as quantitative. In other words, their personalities are described in terms of the same types, P, E, and N, as normals, but they have abnormally high scores on one or more superfactors, particularly on P and or N. It should be noted, however, that high scores on P or N do not necessarily guarantee psychopathology. As we saw above, traits require interaction with specific situations in order to attain full expression. There are many individuals whose psych psychoticism, neuroticism, and extroversion scores resemble those of the average manic depressive or schizophrenic, and yet who manage to lead relatively contented, symptom-free lives. Perhaps an individual's location within Eisen Kian three-dimensional space can appropriately be regarded as a measure of his or her vulnerability to different kinds of mental illness. Psychotherapy. Ideally for Cattell, psychotherapy is preceded by a precise personality factor assessment. Such a profile does not, de not only defies exactly what the problem is, but also aids the clinician in determining the most effective treatment procedure. As far as therapeutic treatment is concerned, Cattell was an eclectic. He thought the type of disorder revealed by testing should determine the appro approach to treatment. Drugs or electric shock may best treat severe psychosis. Dream analysis may best treat certain neurosis. And behavior therapy, discussed in the next chapter, may best treat relatively minor problems. Isaac also suggested that accurate personality test le leads to correct diagnosis and results in appropriate and more effective treatment. While Cattell was eclectic in his approach to therapy, Isaac, a longtime critic of psychoanalysis and proponent of behavior therapy, was far less accepting of therapies lacking empirical support. For Isaac, therapy must be based on demonstrated psychological principles such as those derived from classical or operant conditioning. The ultimate test of a therapy lies not in its intent, but in empirical evidence showing that patients receiving therapy actually improve more than no treatment controls or patients receiving placebo treatments. Cattell and Isaac similarities and differences. Before moving on to more contemporary trait theories, it may be helpful to review the similarities and differences between Cattell and Isaac's theories and approaches to personalities. These are outlined in Table 8-4. Contemporary Developments The Big Five A theory of personality called the Big Five, or sometimes the five-factor model, has generated considerable interest among trait theorists. This approach has a large number of active advocates who challenge Cattell's and Isink's analysis and offer an alternative theory with five superfactors. Like Cattell, Isink Isink, like Cattell and Isink, psychologists supporting the Big Five use factor analysis as their primary analytical tool, and two of the five superfactors are virtually identical with two identified by Isink. And as we shall see, Cattell's research is cited to support the contention that five factors are better than three or 16. Specifically, the five superfactors include neuroticism and extroversion, defined in much the same way that Isink defined them. Also included are higher order factors called openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Students may want to use the acronym OCEAN to remember the five factors. Definitions of these factors are found on Table 8-5. 
Although research on the Big Five has become popular in the past few decades, the history of this approach can be traced back over 100 years to the work of Sir Francis Galton, and its history is grounded in the lexical hypothesis. The basic premise of the lexical hypothesis is that all we need to know about personality is contained in natural language. That is, the terms we commonly and sometimes uncommonly use to describe ourselves and each other contain all the information necessary to discern the fundamental dimensions of human personality. Galton, 1884, without the statistical power of factor analysis, collected terms from the dictionary that were descriptive of personality and noted that many of the words shared common meanings. Years later, L. L. Thurstone, who was instrumental in the development of factor analysis, used an adjective checklist method in which he provided experimental participants with a list of 60 personality descriptive adjectives. Participants were asked to think about some other person and indicate whether each of the adjectives was descriptive of that person. Thurston factor analyzed the resulting data and concluded that the complexity of human personality could be described using as few as five major factors. He did not, however, suggest what those factors might be. Two years later, Alpor and Odbert, beginning with nearly 18,000 adjectives, developed a collection of approximately 4,500 personality descriptive terms, 35 of which were used by Cattell in a factor analytic study. As we saw previously, Cattell preferred to extract as many factors as possible in his data sets, and in his treatment of the 35 personality terms, he found at least 12 factors. Different researchers, and most notably Toops and Crystal, reanalyzed Cattell's variables and concluded that only five of his factors could be replicated. Although some of the names have changed, those factors are the same as those that have been the basis of all subsequent work on the Big Five. The researchers most often associated with the Big Five, Paul T. Costa, Robert R. McRae, entered the trait debate with a three-factor theory derived from a personality questionnaire rather than from an adjective checklist. Their first set of superfactors consisted of neuroticism, extroversion, and openness, and the personality inventory that these authors developed is the Neo-Pi, Neuroticism, Extroversion, Openness, Dash, Personality Inventory. After attending two symposia led by Digma and Goldberg, two researchers from the lexical school described above, Costa and McRae, were convinced that the two additional factors of agreeableness and conscientiousness should be added to their model. They further refined their personality questionnaire, and later researchers developed six facets, lower order traits, for each of the five superfactors in the big five. Recently, another factor model, the Hexaco, has emerged with an, emerged with an additional honesty humility factor. This new six-factor model has been found to demonstrate good cross-cultural reliability. Much of the current personality research is done using one of the aforementioned models, type D personality. Recall that according to Isaac, the neurotic introvert has the most aroused nervous system. Denolet was the first to suggest that this particular combination of traits predispose individuals for negative health outcomes, and he labeled this combination the type D distress personality. Early Speculation was that veterans with type D personality would more likely be more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. However, the research that suggests a link between type D personality and PTSD is inconclusive. Other aspects of, of health are clearly impl implicated, however. In a sample of Dutch workers, those with type D personality tended to express higher levels of exhaustion, report more depressive symptoms, take more sick days, and experience more job burnout than non-type D workers. Type D individuals engage more often in maladaptive health behaviors such as smoking, using alcohol, eating poor diets, uh, eating poor diets, and avoiding physical exercise. Further, type D patients with heart disease are at increased risk of death compared with non-type D patients. The growing research literature on type D personality demonstrates how certain traits in combination can have effects beyond the domains commonly addressed by personality theory. Had the Big Five displaced Cattell and Isink. McRae suggests that theories such as Freud's, Arnais, and Erickson's, even Cattell's and Isink's, are so outdated that they should not be taught in, person, in a personality course and that the Big Five has finally brought scientific clarity to the field of personality psychology. There is no doubt that the Big Five has generated extensive research. For example, patients high in agreeableness cope better after a diagnosis of diabetes and attain higher levels of life satisfaction after disabling accidents. On the other hand, individuals with low agreeableness and openness are more likely to join the military and become even less agreeable after military training. Extroverts seem to be predisposed to experience positive emotions. 
Extroverted individuals are also more able to relax and most likely better able to cope with stress. Not surprisingly, when people have high extroversion combined with high agreeableness, they tend to have more children. Researchers using brain imaging techniques had even proposed that each of the big five factors has its own brain area mediating expression of that factor, although other researchers recommend caution in interpreting such imaging studies. Not all research is supportive, however, while researchers find evidence for the big five in developing countries among literate research participants, the five personality dimensions do not appear in all cultures. In contrast to previously discussed longitudinal studies of EN and EN, some research finds that the big five personality traits vary in early and later life, suggesting a U-shaped pattern of change, and that certain life transitions may also change these traits. Despite the popularity of the big five approach, Cattell and Isaac refused to adopt it. Isaac contended that agreeableness and consciousness are primary tra traits rather than super factors, and conclude that advocates of the big five confuse super factors, neuroticism and extroversion, with primary traits, agreeableness and conscientiousness, in order to inflate the number of super factors in their theory. Trey Cotton Klein analyzed both Costa and McRae's Neo Pi and the Isaac personality questionnaire revised and agreed with Isaac's claim that the big five mixes lower order with higher order factors. In addition, Isaac reported that several studies show openness to be related to intelligence and that according to Isaac is a cognitive ability factor, not a temperament factor. Indeed, a study of 844 individuals, including monozygotic and dizygotic twins, found the strongest genetic links to openness, as would be expected if researchers were investigating genetic links to intelligence. Longitudinal research of the following children from the United Kingdom also found that intelligence in childhood was the best predictor to, of the openness to experience trait in adults, further confirming that cognition and openness are closely related. A direct attack on the Big Five comes from Bloch, who retraces the history of the Big Five and suggests that the emergence of five factors is more a matter of research planning than it is a matter of empirical discovery. He suggests that the advocates of the Big Five have invested their research interest in validating the five factors rather than testing the theory. Even Costa and McRae indicate that beyond identification of openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness, the Big Five add little to the support to the current body of data about personality. They note that the theory contains few surprises. The basic ideas are familiar from many personality theories. Furthermore, other critics have agreed with Cattell and Isaac's criticism for this model, suggesting that it is incomplete. In fact, research indicates that these five traits account for only 60% variance in the entire personality's trait spectrum. Thus, while the Big Five model enjoys a degree of popularity, it does not replace Isaac's Penn or Cattell's 16PF. Evaluation. Cattell and Isaac's theories are unique among theories presented so far in this text because of their substantial empirical support. Numerous studies have been discussed throughout this chapter and a few more discussed below. Cattell, empirical research. The 16PF is still a wide use today. Mansfield, Green, Morisal, Valiant, Caswell recently used the 16PF to determine which personality characteristics were related to college students' attitudes toward older adults. They found that warmth, emotional stability, and rural consciousness were closely related to positive attitudes toward older adults. In 2016, Noel Trochia Luckett used the 16PF to examine personality differences among different college majors. They found that accounting majors scored significantly different on all of Cattell's factors when compared to both psychology and marketing majors. They discovered that Cattell's factor B, which assesses concrete versus creative thinking, was the most related to a choice of major. Predictive science and determinism. Like Isaacs and Cattell believed a theory of personality is of little value unless it can predict behavior. Cattell believed behavior is a function of finite number of variables, and if those variables are completely known, human behavior can be predicted with complete accuracy. Such a belief characterizes determinism. Cattell and other determinists realized that all of the variables influence behavior can never be known, so the prediction of behavior will always be problematic, probabilistic. What then is personality to Cattell? It is that which allows the accurate prediction of a person's behavior. Personality is that which permits a, a prediction of what a person will do in a given situation. The goal of psychological research in personality is thus to establish laws about what different people will do in all kinds of social and general environmental issues. Personality is concerned with all behavior of the individual, both overt and under the skin. Isaac Empirical Research 
Experimental and correlation studies spanning more than 50 years have provided an impressive database to support ISNIC's claims concerning E and to a lesser extent N and P. These studies range from relatively straightforward confirmations concerning the behaviors of basic personality types to very complex attempts to reveal the brain functions assumed by the ARAS-VB arousal model. Social behavior. Both male and female extroverts are more likely to have sexual intercourse at younger ages than introverts. They are more likely to have multiple sexual partners and they are more likely to engage in different types of sexual activities. Individuals scoring lower in eroticism, as measured by the EPQ, were also found to have higher, higher marital satisfaction. Currently, ISNIC's traits are getting a significant amount of attention in criminal and forensic psychology. In his early work, Eisnick reported that individuals with a high E, high N, and high P scores are more likely to engage in criminal activity, and this seems to have garnered more support through research. Busevich, Highland, and Bork, for example, found that psychoticism, as measured by the EPQR, was a significant predictor of homicidal behavior. Other research has shown that recidivism and criminal thinking styles are positively associated with individuals who score high on psychoticism but low on neuroticism and extroversion, contradicting some of Isink's early findings. Perceptual phenomena. Elliot and Ludwig and Hap asked experimental participants to adjust auditory tones to levels that were just loud enough to be uncomfortable. In both experiments, extroverts adjusted tones to levels that were louder than those selected by introverts. Compared with introverts, extroverts will tolerate strong electrical shock or painfully cold temperatures at more intense levels for longer periods of time before asking the experimenter to terminate the painful stimuli. Conditioning. Eye blink conditioning is often used to demonstrate classical conditioning in humans, and Isaac and Jones and Isaac Martin and Levy reported that, in general, introverts demonstrate more rapid eye blink conditioning than extroverts. Isaac and Levy determined that introverts did demonstrate superior conditioning under partial reinforcement schedules with weak to moderately strong USs and at short CS-US intervals, as might be predicted if they have higher cortical arousal. Conversely, extroverts acquire condition response more rapidly under continuous reinforcement with strong USs and when the CS-US interval is relatively strong. Research on eye blink conditioning has more recently focused on cortical arousal and psychoticism psychotherapy. Often, more neurological, neurobiological findings, sorry, other, more neurobiological findings support Isaac's theory of uh, corotical uh, arousal, although not much more has been done with conditioning. FMRI results suggest that cortical activity for introverts and extroverts varies by cognitive load in a similar manner to that proposed by Isaac. Other FMRI research shows that extroverts respond more to positive emotional cues. These neurobiological studies are a modern way of validating Isaac's theory. For a critical examination of Isaac's main research endeavors, see Mogdil and Mogdil and Isaac. Criticisms. Behavior not as consistent as a factor theory suggests. Although Cattell and Isaac did not ignore the influence of specific environmental situations on behavior, they still assumed a considerable amount of cross-situational consistency in behavior. Critics claim that such consistency simply does not exist. To the extent to which it is found that behavior is not at least moderately consistent across time and similar situations, theories such as those Allport, Cattell, and Eisnick suffer. Excessive emphasis on groups and averages. Allport argued that Cattell's method yielded average traits that no person actually possessed when examined more individually. Elsewhere, Allport said that the traits produced by factor analysis resemble sausage meat that has failed to pass the pure food and health inspection. Alper's point is valid only when one looks at how traits are superfactors are identified. Most of this research did involve large groups of people and dealt with averages. Once the 16 personality traits or three superfactors were isolated, however, they were used to understand the behavior of individual persons and to predict individual behavior. To say that Cattell and Isink were only interested in group and in averages is incorrect. Reification. Reification occurs when it is assumed that a verbal label refers to something that exists physically. We saw in Chapter 7 that Alport believed traits were real psychophysical structures that determine behavior. Cattell and Isaac, too, imply that the source of traits and superfactors actually exist. If traits are considered convenient fictions postulated for science expediency, there is no problem. There is, however, little evidence suggesting that source traits and superfactors have material existence. Contributions both Cattell and Eisnick are notable for their pioneering scientific efforts in a field that was, and it was, in its early forms, riddled with unbridled speculation and unsubstantiated near-mystical beliefs. 
because the use of scientific methodology in the study of personality is often characterized as the most significant contribution made by Cattell and Isaac, we will elaborate their scientific orientations next. Cattell, Beyondism. Throughout his career, Cattell has combined scientific rigor with compassion for the human situation. These dual interests are exemplified in Cattell's books A New Morality from Science, Beyondism, and Beyondism, Religion from Science. Define Beyondism as follows. What briefly is Beyondism? It is a system for discovering and clarifying ethical goals from a basis of scientific knowledge and investigation by the objective research procedures of scientific method. Beyondism places great value on evolutionary principles such as fitness and natural selection. Traditional moral systems were, were based on revealed knowledge and were taken on faith. By contrast, the religion of Beyondism will be based on scientific facts, the effectiveness of which can be objectively evaluated. With good fortune, we shall before long see the revealed religions fading out of the more advanced countries. Out of the superstition-ridden night of the past 2,000 years will gradually dawn the light of science-based evolutionary religion. It is to this new structuring of life that the present believers in Beyondism must apply themselves. Needless to say, Cattell's proposal to replace traditional religions, religious foundation of morality with scientific objectivity was another reason he was surrounded by controversy. Isaac. Farewell to, farewell to mytho mythical psychology. As an advocate of the hypothetic deductive method in scientific research, Isaac attempted to develop a testable psycho psychological theory in the natural science tradition. He challenged other psychologists to subject their own theories to the same scrutiny, and he rejected many theories, including many of those covered in this text because of their scientific shortcomings. As an example, I would class among the inadmissible theories those of Freud, Adler, Jung, Binswanger, Ornai, Sullivan, Fromm, Erickson, and Maslow. They fail, fail essentially because, for the most part, they do not generate testable deductions because where they do so, the deductors have most frequently been falsified and because they fail to include particularly all the experimental and empirical studies which have been done over the last 50 years. Why then are these theories popular? According to Isaac, their popularity is largely explained by the common tendency of not letting the difficult and often relatively uninteresting scientific truth stand in the way of an unscientific good story. Most, the pe most people, of course, whatever they may say, do not in fact want a scientific account of human nature and personality at all. Indeed, this is the last thing they really wish for. Hence, they much prefer the great storyteller Freud or the great myth creator Jung to those like Cattell or Guilford Expect them to learn matrix algebra, study physiological details of the nervous system, and actually carry out experiments, rather than relying on interesting anecdotes, set-ridden case, sex-ridden case histories, and ingenious speculation. After all, after-dinner conversation can easily encompass the Oedipus complex or penis envy. It would be much more difficult to talk about a non-grimain matrix or the particular formation. According to Farley, Isaac's efforts to import the rigor of hard science into the soft area of personality were truly remarkable. His identification and measurement of the most basic, pervasive, and reliable dimensions of personality stand as one of psychology's greatest achievements. Applied value, personality tests derived by Cattell and Isaac have been used for clinical diagnosis, personnel selection, vocational counseling, marital counseling, and to predict accident proneness. The possibility of heart attacks in men, rates of recovery from cancer, and scholastic performance. Versions of Cattell's evaluative devices, for example, have been translated into more than a dozen languages, and in each language they are used extensively for both research and practical applications. Here, listed on this page, is the summary. You can start to read some of that there. I'm not going to read that out loud. I'm done. Page one. And here comes the last page of the summary. Page two. And you can pause that and read through that. Here are your vocabulary words, a glossary. And glossary. And that is all.